Listen, thank you very much for coming out today to this plenary. Um, we've got a stellar group of, uh, of speakers here today, and we're going to interrogate an issue that we think doesn't receive efficient, sufficient attention. And I think those of, who was here at Dr. Goosby's uh, talk uh, this morning, yeah. So one strong thread that I think he left us with, one message, was implementation and being able to engage different groups, including politicians and governments. Because if the one group you think about it, if you want to make stuff happen, that one group that has more responsibility than anybody to deliver public goods for the people are, in fact, governments. So we have a stellar group, and I'll just introduce them uh, in the order that they will come. And they come from different quarters, but all of them will bring something unique to this challenge. And what I hope that we'll be able to do is together, we're going to explore what we can do to be able to overcome the gap between the amazing research that we produce and that implementation of that. So on my right, the first speaker after myself will be uh, uh, Dr. Jimena uh, Garcon Bilalba. Dr. Garcon Villalba was the former Minister of Health from Ecuador, and she's the Dean of Public Health at USFQ in Ecuador. Professor Jonathan Cohen is the Director of Health and Equities, the Center for Health and Equities at the University of Southern California, and he's a lawyer by trade, so it's great we're getting more lawyers into our field. Then after that will be uh, Ms. Heine Utenen. Uh, uh, Heine is the head of learning and capacity building at the World Health Organization. So this is critically important, obviously, that we can learn from her in terms of the innovations that she's helping to lead at the WHO in this area. And finally, it's a pleasure to bring together an old friend, uh, Dr. P professor Peter Berman. Uh, professor Berman is Emeritus Professor at the University of British Columbia. He's an adjunct professor at Harvard, and he's a health economist. So he's the bank. So. Let's start. We know these are our goals, right, in terms of what we're trying to achieve. But if we have posited the question, how close are we to achieving the 17 sustainable goals by 2030, who thinks we're on track? Yeah. But we're not even close, right? So then the question is, why do we keep going from goals and goals and targets to targets and that we're not achieving them? What are the gaps? That, innate, that, we're not, that we're missing in terms of being able to achieve the goals that we often set with much fanfare. So if you look at the top healthcare risks, I mean, it's far away for those in the back, but just generally speaking, those in green are the environmental ones. On your left will be the two-year health risks. This comes from the World Economic Forum. And on, on, your, uh, on your right, are the 10-year risks. So you can see that there's a shift towards more environmental risks, but there's still many other ones there, including misinformation and disinformation, number one, extreme weather events, societal polarization, economic downturns, and others. What was interesting for me when I saw this, and I found this quite curious, that here it is at the World Economic Forum in Davos, but what's missing in this? What's missing in this is what we're seeing almost every day in the news, is the really the undermining of the political structures, the governance structures, and democracy and freedom that have kind of held the world order together after World War II and enabled us to have an amazing security and uh, outcomes for health and people's welfare. But that structure is being deeply undermined. And what we have right now is we're, and at CUGH, we're trying to interrogate this vexing challenge. We produce a mountain of knowledge, right? I was remember being at the, um, uh, at a large, at the World Bank, and the World Bank does a lot of amazing, produces a lot of amazing reports. But I went into this room, and literally this room was a sea of outstanding reports, piled high. And I asked myself, is this the place where reports and research goes to die, right? And then, on the other hand, it broke my heart, right? If you leaf through this, you go, wow, this is amazing stuff that deals with contemporary challenges. And wherever you go, I, I, I'm sure you feel the same way, right? You look and going, this is amazing research. How can we get this research from the journal and into, into practice and into implementation? So we have a mountain of knowledge, but the tragedy is a trickle of implementation. 
So how can we overcome that? There's opportunities in this. One of the big challenges, as I mentioned before, is that in order to get stuff done, in the place to do it, frankly, is, is in structures in government. Because governments have the primary responsibility to do that. And I want to show a, a, a book that uh, my friend, uh, uh, Dr. Joe Ivy Buford, who's there. Joe Ivy, you want to raise your hand? She co-authored this book called Strong Ministries for Strong Health Systems. And there is a line in the beginning of this written by Professor Paul Evans at McGill. And he said, one area that we neglect at our peril is we neglect the ability of governments and ministries to be able to have the people to be able to deliver the public programs that they require. So what we're seeing, unfortunately, is we're seeing an undermining of those structures. And an undermining of those structures is actually an assault on democracy and freedom. And tragically, we're seeing an 18-year decline in the space. So why is this important? If you look at this, at this list, these are the nations with the lowest human development index. The human development index looks at a bucket of inputs and outcomes for people's well-being, a little bit partially the social determinants of health. And if you look at these countries, what do they have in common? Each one of those countries has very weak, weak governance structures. They're, they're, they're not necessarily democratic. The governance structures are weak. The public service is weak. And you have really poor governance, which really impedes the ability of those governments to be able to deliver the public goods people require. And so there are consequences for this. One of the consequences is actually corruption. And again, if you look at this list of the world's most corrupt nations, again, what do they have in common? Not one of them is a government that actually is a democracy that actually functions effectively. Each one of them, and many of them, are actually covered by autocracies or deeply dysfunctional governments that are actually abusing their countries. Why is that important? This is why it's important. If we're going to be able to deliver the public goods and translate the research that you're producing, we absolutely have to recognize and acknowledge that the political determinants of health is like the gorilla at the dining table. Unless we deal with these challenges of being able to address those, the, those political determinants of health, we're not going to be able to go and deliver the goods we require. No government will actually have the tools, the powers, the structures, the oversight, and the ability to deliver those public goods. And this is, this is the, the, what, I, what I mean by that. We often focus on the top, right, the sustainable development goals. But think, if we were going to implement a program for public health, reducing maternal mortality, climate change, you name it, what do you need to do that? You need to have strong ministries, but you also, it's not only health, right? Who pays? You've got to have strong ministries of finance. And you've got to have strong justice departments. So there are various components that we must have. And I think all of us naturally in the health field, we tend to look at ministries of health, right? But our allies in this battle, we've got to have strong justice systems. Because who protects people's rights? You know, when I was in, um, in my previous job in parliament, I used to spend a fair bit of time going to different areas in crisis. And I remember sitting in a, in a country that um, I will not name, in sub-Saharan Africa. And I was under a, a, a tree. Uh, and these farmers were basically saying to me that if you don't stop, the leader of our country is going to kill us. So what happened to this country, which had a lifespan of 55, within five years, the lifespan for men declined to 32 and to women to 28. And it was because that government chose to use food as a weapon. It chose to deprive people that, it wasn't, that weren't supporting them and deprive them of food in a country that had a high HIV rate, right? So you have a double, patients need higher caloric intake, so they've got a double, double dose of that. The concept of the, the, the failure to actually have strong systems in finance and justice and independent oversight mechanisms means that autocracies and corruption can actually uh, breed. And when we get down to the bottom line and who pays, 
you know, most of the time when we have these discussions in international meetings, right, we often go and, and have these discussions as which governments are going to meet 0.7% of GDP for their official development assistance, right? That's usually the discussion on pay. But if you ask the question of how much does it cost, is it going to cost annually to achieve the SDGs, does anybody know what that is? It's between 1.5 and $3 trillion a year. If you also ask the question as to how much money is lost to corruption every year, 1.5 to $3 trillion a year. Official development assistance is about $152 billion a year. So unless we deal with this, unless we deal with this and work with countries that are interested in strengthening this, we'll never be able to bring to life the interventions we know will improve people's outcomes for their socioeconomic well-being. And in the failure to do that, you've got state instability, you've got corruption, conflict, and serial human rights abuses that have dramatic effects on people's lives. So with that, uh, I'll just close up right now with the last couple of slides. What do we need to get things done? You need to secure political leadership and commitments. That's critically important. Putting stuff into a journal is a good first step, but without strong long-term political commitments, you're not going to get it implemented. Engage the public, because the public moves the political. Strengthen, again, institutional public service capacity. And this is where we have an opportunity for academic institutions to engage with their governments that are willing and interested in saying, I need more training for my public service. How do I get that? So there's opportunities to do that. And funders need to be challenged to be able to say, you need to fund deepening relationships between academic institutions in those countries and their governments to do two things, the training of their public service and to do the research that those governments cannot do themselves. Anyway, so I will uh, leave with one last word. And if I can quote uh, um, uh, Rudolf Virchow, the father of public health and Albert Einstein, and I think Dr. Goosby this morning sort of alluded to that because he's lived a life of that, that those of us in science have to be political, not partisan, but we have to get into the political arena. Because if we don't get into the political arena, bad actors will take over and they'll continue to do bad things to good people. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much, Keith, for your words. I 100% agree with them. And thank you for inviting me to this important uh, meeting and, and session. I think that the, the uh, talking about politics and public health is extremely important and it's going to make a difference. And uh, let me talk about just quit this one. There you are. Okay, yeah, <laughs> okay, thank you. So I was thinking when you were talking about um, the government, that government have the power and the, and the opportunity to improve health systems and, and also public health in general, that sometimes that doesn't happen. Even though um, I was Minister of Health and I had the the capacity of decision and implementation. Sometimes, as you said, uh, when you don't have a, a finance, a strong finance ministry and justice department that support your decision, that's going to be very, very difficult. Um, you can have the knowledge, the experience, the goodwill to change public health and even though if you are trying and trying, you're not going to be able to do it. Uh, public health, we are, all, all of us do public health. And all the ministries in a government must do public health. Um, it's important also the commitment of, of the head of the government, uh, the president in this case, to change something that has been hitting the population. And th that's a very good um, example in my country, in Ecuador, uh, when we 
um, implemented the vaccination plan, the head of the government, the, the president was heading really the, the, implement, the, the vaccination plan. He was um, helping me and, and, and uh, pushing uh, up the, the, the implementation of the vaccination plan. And the same happened with undernutrition. He was heading also this program of undernutrition uh, to prevent and to help undernutrition in my country, and it was very successful. So, of course, um, the head of the government has to be very committed with any implementation in, in, in public health to be able to, to support it and uh, that it could be successful. But also we have to understand that in low medium income countries and, and low income countries, there are limited resources as, for example, uh, human resources uh, and also lack of funding. So we are not able sometimes to have enough te technology or affordable technology because perhaps we have for private um, systems, health systems, but not for the public system. We don't have good quality of data. We, we lack good quality of data because we don't have electronic systems to help us to, to take decisions. So that's a very, uh, that's an obstacle because we can't provide with a, a confident and reliable information to um, decision makers based on re in, in, in good quality research. We have also political opposition, which is very strong because of they don't believe what we are doing or perhaps we are from another political party or because they, we are affecting their conveniences or because um, they have their own interests. That's something that we have to take into account. Bureaucratic red tape, very complicated processes inside of the government. Lack of public support. Sometimes we speak in different language than, than the public. We are not able to communicate our ideas or our goals in a, in a simple way to engage the, the population. So that happens in the, during the, the pandemics with the vaccination and happens also in many other public health uh, interventions. Global coordination, that's something very important. We need the support of high income countries. We need the support of low medium income countries too, in the same region, between country and country, share experiences, share also resources because as we don't have enough resources, maybe if we support each other in the region, we, we could share the, the responsibilities and also the, uh, the um, resources that we have available to implement and to develop also policies. Well, we can do a lot as academia. Global health practitioners can do better job engaging governments in, if we can, as, as Keith said before, engage the decision makers in or plan for, uh, for uh, public health, always trying to uh, explain them what are our goals based on evidence, but good, good quality of data. And that's something that perhaps high income countries could help us, low income countries, to develop better quality of information. Stakeholder collaboration is also very, very important. As I said before, not just Health is not just the responsibility of public health practitioners. It is um, the responsibility of economists, lawyers, architects, engineers, veterinarians. This is a multidisciplinary um, strategy that we have to implement in our countries. Otherwise, we're going to keep working in silos and not working together. You, human beings are very complex, and our societies are also very complex. The determinants of health are so different. Uh, it, it's a wide array of, of determinants of health. 
So it's not just the responsibility of health practitioners, it's also the responsibility of many different uh, professions and, and also sectors. Private sector is very important. Um, the, the civil society is very important, is, is crucial. Because if you think about what is happening with, with governments in many of the countries that Keith was saying, the, the country is corrupted or, or maybe they don't care about the population. Um, but what happened with civil society? Why don't we, in, in the base of the pyramids, work together to change the structure of public health? I think that that's something that, that we ha have to th think about it. Not just relying on the government, because sometimes the government could have good intentions, as happened in, in Ecuador, in the former, former government, but there's a lot of resistance to change. Policy dialogue and, and education, that's something that academics should do. Capacity building, that's something really important. Uh, to have uh, very strong human resources, um, all, the imp all the instruments that we need, all the tools that we need to implement good interventions to change policies in our countries. Public awareness campaigns, how do we want to change the way of thinking in the civil society if we, do don't, we don't do um, good campaigns to make them understand what is the, the goal of that public health intervention and to involve them in the planification, in the development and in the uh, implementation of the intervention. That is very important because sometimes as we are um, public health pro uh, professionals and experts and, and, and we think that we know everything, right, sometimes. <laughs> and it's like we want to cookie cut any intervention in any part of the planet and we don't understand what is happening in that population, in that community, what are the needs for that community. Perhaps we think that they need, um, I don't know, perhaps multivitamins, vitamins, yeah, for the population, for the children, and what they need is, is clean water or sanitation. So it's very important to, to engage with the community, to know really what are their, their needs. And perhaps if, if we realize what are their needs, because we are the experts, how to guide them to understand that the needs are different what, than what they are believing. Advocacy for policy coherence, and that happened very frequent in our countries. Um, ministries of Health are working separately from education and for, uh, from finance and from environment. Why don't we work together? That's very important. Otherwise, we're going to be overlapping efforts, wasting re re the, the little resources that we have. So it's very important to work together inside of the government and also to work together with, with um, policies, international policies. Adapting to the local context, that, what, that is what I was saying about the needs of the population. Long-term strategies. How do we support those strategies for the future? How do we make it sustainable in the time? In, in my country, for example, there has been many uh, beautiful interventions to help a uh, population. But when the government changes, all those interventions go to the trash. And we have to start again. So how many resources are we wasting? And well, I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. Greetings, colleagues. I want to thank uh, the Honorable Keith Martin for this invitation, including the, the invitation to be political, 
which I hope I will take you up on. I'd like to make four points this afternoon. The first is that arguably the most important political determinant of health in 2024 is the pursuit of political ends through military means. We have delegates to this conference from Tigray, Ethiopia, where over a million civilians have died as a result of wartime violence, famine, and lack of access to health care. We're seeing a similar horror unfold before our eyes in Gaza. We've seen that in situations of protracted conflict and forced displacement from Burma to Haiti to South Sudan to Yemen, I could go on, the state has proven largely incapable of delivering on the right to health for its people, and civil society and humanitarian actors have had to step into the breach and create parallel systems of healthcare. In Gaza, as we speak, the political decision to pursue military action to solve a political problem has decimated the health system, leaving the entire population without any ability to realize their human right to health or even their right to life. The second point I want to make, which is related, is that the so-called democratic decline that Keith Martin mentioned in his opening carries a number of features that are associated with the strongman politics of the moment. These features include exploiting the anger of poor and working class people to enlist their support for policies that benefit wealthy people and corporations. They include appealing to racism and xenophobia to deflect attention from this very strategy and from corporate capture of the regulatory and welfare state on which our health depends. And they include attacking scientific information, consensus, and evidence in favor of ideological policies that harm women, harm the environment, and harm public health. Third point that I'd like to make is that the international human rights framework provides us with a basis for building a different kind of political future in which all people can enjoy their highest attainable standard of health. Human rights tells us that health care must be available, accessible, acceptable, and of good quality. And human rights also tells us that in order to enjoy health, all people must also have access to the social determinants of health, which correspond to the full range of human rights guaranteed under international law. These rights include positive rights, negative liberties, and protection of abuse by private actors. So the question becomes, what kinds of political choices and what kind of political system enable the respect, protection, and fulfillment of the full range of rights. And let's take each of these in person. Positive rights include, of course, the human right to health, to housing, to education, to a standard of living, to a healthy environment. And I would argue that guaranteeing these requires at least three political conditions. First, at a bare minimum, a system of fair taxation and economic redistribution. Second, a process of democratic deliberation and participation that gives beneficiaries a say in the design and delivery of these programs. And thirdly, a regulatory state to prevent the private sector from commodifying these public goods at the expense of access, affordability, and equity. All three of these conditions erode in the conditions of authoritarian and corporate capture of the political moment today. What are negative liberties? These are freedoms from state-sponsored violence, from arbitrary detention, from censorship, all essential to human health, 
all of which also require fundamental political arrangements. First, they require a system of checks and balances to safeguard against the abuse of executive power. They require an independent judiciary, entrusted, empowered, and capable of adjudicating all forms of state action according to established constitutional principles and precedent. And third, they require full protection of due process under the law, which in turn requires legal aid and a system of criminal justice, all of which, again, are precisely the things that authoritarians and autocrats attempt to undermine. And lastly, let's look at the human right to protection from abuse by private third party actors, from violence against women, from racial discrimination, from disability discrimination. What kinds of political choices and arrangements and governance structures does this kind of protection require? It requires systems of individual redress that provide survivors of abuse with legal remedies and, and compensation and that deter future abusers. It requires systems of group redress that provide historically disadvantaged groups with opportunities to participate in society and the econ economy on an equal basis with others, drawing on principles of equity. And it requires systems of prevention that educate individuals and institutions about the forms and determinants of private actor violence and how to identify and prevent them. Again, we see over and over how authoritarian leaders flout the need for such measures, instead fomenting hatred and private actor violence against marginalized groups, and moreover denying and rewriting histories of their marginalization. So in short, the human rights paradigm, the obligations to respect, protect, and fulfill the full range of civil, political, economic, social, and cultural rights provides us with at least a partial blueprint for the kinds of political choices that will safeguard the human right to health in the future. The fourth point that I'd like to make is that in order to secure this human rights-based future of governance for health, we need to strengthen democracy. And here's where I would turn to the work of Nancy Krieger and others who have argued that ultimately, we need to focus on the quality of political participation as a determinant of health, because that is what will ensure a political system that actually represents the desires and needs of the body politic. Krieger encourages public health practitioners like us to look at issues such as voting rights, political gerrymandering, and the role of money in politics in order to prevent our political system from being hijacked by the interests of racist capitalism. I agree with this wholeheartedly. And in conclusion, I think it also points to the original question that Keith Martin posed, which is what we as global health practitioners can do. We can continue to study and build an evidence base for the ways in which robust political participation in a multiracial democracy can improve human health. We can identify threats to that participation at local, regional, and national levels and leverage health arguments to address them. And we can communicate with one another at conferences such as this about this evidence and about these threats, recognizing that enemies of democracy also operate in transnational networks and are attempting to undermine our own networks, which is why we're here. Lastly, I would urge us to keep returning to a positive vision. It's easier to talk about threats than about the kind of political future we want to build together. The human rights paradigm, and I say this with full awareness of the fragility of that paradigm in times of war, gives us that blueprint for the kinds of political choices and arrangements we need to create in order to have an enabling environment 
for the human right to health. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Keith, for the invitation to join this panel, and, and lovely to be here. We are all true believers in public health and global health. It feels really like at home. I'm Haini Utunen from the World Health Organization, where I lead the learning unit. Um, and I'll talk about the role of the World Health Organization in convening for the global governance and, and for the global health agenda, to keep, it, to keep health in the agenda of the world. Um, and I think we all, uh, we've heard here, everybody's uh, speeches before me and, and speeches earlier today, yesterday, are about this very same topic. How do we keep global health, public health, health in the list of priorities in the agendas, any agendas? And, um, and I think it's a call for action. It's a call for action for all of us who produce evidence, who work across the, the domains of health, to try and think of those ways how we can pe better peruse the existence of health and necessity of the health uh, in the bigger governance agendas. And how the World Health Organization does this is um, us representing the United Nations. Um, in, the, in the system of the United Nations, we are the health agency. We are very small. We are about 4% of the UN staff, about the same percentage of the, the effort and, and budgets. But we are specifically mandated on health. So whenever there is a global topic related to health uh, in the United Nations system, it comes to the World Health Organization's plate. And we are really a norms and standards setting agency. Um, where our core work is to bring the best evidence of the world together uh, and, and, and produce uh, policy recommendations, technical guidance, uh, standards, norms uh, that take the health agenda forward. And we have thousands and thousands of uh, technical guidances, guidelines, recommendations, standards that have been produced together with the academia, universities like yourselves. So WHO's accumulation of the scientific evidence is really made together uh, with the, with the research, research uh, world, uh, the universities, our collaborating centers, our 800 collaborating centers who are the main bodies, the university institutes that uh, actually help us uh, perform the evidence accumulation for different areas of health. And um, just as an example of the, the magnitude of the technical guidance that we produce, for instance, for the um, Ebola West Africa outbreak, we produced more than 600 technical guidance documents uh, in response to the the West Africa uh, Ebola outbreak. Um, and we hold uh, air quality, pollution, um, malnutrition uh, measurement, all types of uh, guidance and norms that, uh, that guide the work uh, in the member states, in the 194 member states. WHO is also custodian of two international laws, one on the tobacco control and one on the international health regulations. And we are living really exciting times just now because we are preparing for the third in the national law of WHO, the pandemic accord. And we hope that in two months from now, the WHO member states in the World Health Assembly will pass the bill on the pandemic preparedness accord. And this is a very exciting time. Um, it doesn't happen very often in, in WHO 76 years of history. This is the only third in the national constitutional um, uh, uh, accord that we are, we are preparing. But WHO has this, this power and we hope that the member states are brave enough to seize this moment after the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, and draw a, a pandemic accord. The work of WHO is very public. For instance, the international negotiating body on the pandemic accord is all publicly available for anybody who's interested. You can follow it in WHO's website and you will see the current 350 amendments that the member states provided for the pandemic accord. 
And all of this work uh, that we do on norms, standards, and guidance is always informed by the uh, best scientists in the world. And in this hall, there are already, I see many uh, temporary advisors, uh, external experts, uh, WHO's um, uh, invited and, and selected um, experts who are coming from the research world who help WHO to establish the uh, norms, standards, and guidance that we then um, hope that the member states will take forward as, as the as the, the scientific evidence in various health areas. And I think that one of the bigger um, works of WHO is to keep the health in the agenda. For instance, this year was the first time ever that the climate negotiations had a health agenda point. It's never happened before. And it's a breakthrough to have an agenda point in the climate discussions, the COP, um, on health, and I think this is the way we have to go forward for all the very reasons that Keith, uh, Ximena, and, and, and Jonathan already here before mentioned, how to bring topics on the attention um, in, the, in the critical agendas, and, and this is where WHO really uh, makes an effort. But we are not able to do this alone. Uh, it's a call for action for anybody, any of you, who actually have that research evidence and, 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 and scientific background to be able to join an area of your expertise and join WHO as a technical advisor uh, in these various areas. The calls for our technical advisors are all publicly available on WHO's website, and I saw this morning there are at least 12 different technical advisory groups that we are calling at this very moment. So I hope if you are in infectious diseases, in clinical management, in emergency medicine, in any area of work, that you join us in WHO, we are just 10,000 staff, we are not very big. Uh, we, we are relying on the, the world's uh, expertise from, from the academia and the universities to help us uh, navigate forward in the scientific uh, work that we are uh, leading to go together with partners. So I think um, it's, it's our role to make that space for the health in the agenda of the world. And for instance, in my own world, I'm delivering WHO's guidance, norms and standards through learning to the world. And currently we have about 8.5 million learners on our open WHO platform. Majority of the learners are from low income and lower middle income countries. About 75% of our learners in our short modular learning uh, resources in 75 different languages um, are actually utilized by the health workforce in the low and lower middle income countries. And, and this is very pra practical way of making WHO's guidance evidence available for the world. But at the same time, it's, a, it's a, a chance for us all to work on those health agendas that need to be present in, in all tables and, and to make those that health for all attainable for all people. And as you said, Jonathan, so beautifully, you cited WHO's constitution in the highest attainment of of uh, health is a human right. And this was true 76 years ago, and it's still true today. And we hope to coordinate and, and, and join forces together with all of you in the work of producing the best possible scientific evidence for policy uh, and, and practitioners in health. Many thanks. <laughs> Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, my appreciation to Keith Martin for inviting me to be part of this uh, plenary session. Um, uh, I received the invitation a bit belatedly, and as Keith said, my background is in health economics, and um, mainly health systems financing and health systems reform. So I want to begin by saying that I'm a bit of an adventurer into this territory of politics and governance, and I will leave it to you to decide whether I am lost or, uh, or heading in an interesting direction. Um, the work I want to share with you, we're going to get a little more down on the ground now in terms of how we can think about analyzing politics and governance in global health and in public health. Um, this work was uh, initiated with the initiation of the pandemic. 
Um, and with a team of colleagues at the University of British Columbia who encompassed public health specialists, epidemiologists, social scientists, political scientists, and others. So um, uh, it's a collective effort. Um, and we were motivated by one initial observation. During the pandemic, there was a great deal of scientific evidence generated and disseminated almost instantaneously everywhere in the world. Almost all the governments and actors in response to the pandemic claimed in some sense that they were, quote, following the science. But they all did very different things. Why? How could they all be following the same science and doing very different things? So we came up with this uh, interest in investigating what we called the upstream factors that were framing and forming decisions for policy and action, which were not the science itself, but other influences. Oh, I have a clicker here somewhere, right? Uh, there it is, okay. Um, so I wanna start with the chart, okay? This is the conceptual framework that we came up with to investigate further how this phenomenon actually came about. And we call this a framework to examine what we call the institutional, political, organizational, and governance factors influencing the COVID-19 response, abbreviated by the awkward uh, abbreviation IPOG. Um, and you, if you focus your attention really on the left-hand side of this chart, this is really where the action was for our investigation because we emphasized, of course, that there were many contextual factors that mattered. Obviously, one of them was basic demography. In many countries of the world, populations were much younger um, and the risks that they faced from the pandemic were different and often less than countries which had much older populations. This is not something that one could change in, uh, in the short term, uh, so it was just a contextual factor. On the left-hand side of this chart, you see a box and it contains the term institutions, politics on the left-hand side, organizations on the right-hand side, and then in the middle, governance, which we focused on as the processes of how decisions were made. So basically, this framework says we can, we can use a, an approach to understand policies decided and actions taken, looking at this intersection between politics and the organizations that are existing to advise or carry out these, pol these policies. And this is the governance that occurs at the intersection, which we narrowly focused on as decision-making processes. Um, and then uh, moving to the right-hand side, these are the actions and outcomes that we sought to explain. Now, one of the interesting things when we started to develop this framework is that we investigated and by the way, this, this chart can be found um, in a paper published uh, in PLOS Global Public Health in 2022 with some further explanations of some of the things I'm gonna share with you briefly. Well, part of what we did is we investigated how were these terms being used in the literature around health policies and processes. So this paper published in Health Policy and Planning essentially is a scoping review of use of these terms over the last 10 years. And what I can share with you briefly as a result of this investigation is that very often these terms are not well defined in the academic literature where they're being used, um, or they're defined in uh, overlapping and rather confusing ways. So one example of this is the term institutions and organizations. These terms are often used as synonyms, um, but actually in the, in, uh, usefully in the literature, they have rather different ways of being defined, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, the author of this paper also noted that the term politics was used in many, many papers about the pandemic response, but often not defined what was meant by politics in those papers. He joked in his uh, article here that politics seems to have been defined the way the Supreme Court Justice in the United States, uh, Potter Stewart, defined obscenity. I know it when I see it. Uh, that's not very helpful for academic investigation. Um, and lastly, governance is a term which has many different definitions. 
Um, and there's an excellent review of this lit literature which highlights these definitions, and I just want to point out that we chose to focus on only one of those definitions, which is the decision-making processes and how those occur. So briefly, some of the definitions. We use the term institutions the way that uh, is derived from uh, institutional economics and political institutionalism, which has to do with more the underlying and high-level values uh, or rules of conduct and behavior that are widely accepted in societies. Um, and not organizations. We did not use the term institutions synonymous with organizations. Let me give you one example that came out of our research of how this really played out in the pandemic. You can think of, insti uh, of institutions encompassing two rather contradictory expectations for the role of the state and living in organized society. One of them is that the state should step forward to protect you in the face of a threat and social solidarity should come together and enable the state to protect us in the, in the, in the face of a threat like COVID-19. But coexisting with that is a notion that the state should not interfere with my individual rights. These are both widely accepted institutions in many of our societies. They came into conflict uh, during the pandemic, and we saw some of the results of that. And so they were very influential in the way that politicians and organizations acted. For politics, we looked mainly at who the actors were and some of their um, philosophical and ideological affiliations, not so much the higher level political categories that political scientists often look at, such as regime type or the role of electoral institutions. We looked more at the actors in the process. For organizations, we tried to understand specifically the public health organizations. We often hear the term public health systems being used, but if you really dig in and try to understand what is the public health system, who are the actors that are responsible for carrying out public health actions, you find that many of the expectations of these systems, often described in what has been used internationally as essential public health functions, are actually not carried out by public health organizations at all. They're carried out by clinical organizations. They're carried out by other uh, governmental bodies and regulatory organizations and so on. So is the public health system everything that impacts the public's health? Some of us would like to think so, but that doesn't make it a very useful definition for analysis of understanding how it operates, right? Uh, and I did mention governance. We focused on processes. So um, without going into many of the detailed results that came out of this work, we were able to apply this framework in a set of co case studies on COVID response in uh, countries at both high and lower and middle income levels. Um, and there's a volume in press, a three volume series in press, which includes evidence from these theories and concepts, as well as these case studies coming out sometime later this year from world scientific publishers. And another volume on public health and policy, which looked mostly at European countries, applying elements of this framework, um, edited by Professor Catherine Fielbeck at Dalhousie University in Canada. And I think these will be rich uh, case-based studies of how these factors actually exist. You won't be surprised to think that we found that actually these upstream factors really do play a very significant role in what actually happened. There's ongoing comparative work in Canada, across, com comparing across Canadian provinces, and in large federal countries where many of these responsibilities are given down to lower levels of government, like states and provinces, like Canada, the United States, and many other uh, countries around the world. This is an amazing opportunity to understand how these factors operate in conditions which control for some of the external variables, and so more could be done on this. Our team has been developing teaching cases for public health uh, practitioners and leaders. And uh, I would argue that this framework, this IPOG framework, could be applied much more broadly to population health determinants, including the actors who uh, work in other areas important in public health, like food and nutrition policy, like climate impact, housing, mental health, and substance use, and so on. So maybe there's some work to be done in the future. There is a website, uh, www.governhealth.ca, where some of this work has been summarized, but 
I confess it does need some updating. So let me conclude with just some simple observations from a very large body of work, okay? The first is that the predominant political science approaches and normative frameworks of governance have not always been predictive of actions and outcomes. Um, the research on politics and pandemic response really did show us that the expectations that the countries that were, quote, best prepared, as, a, as documented in the Global Health Security Index, or that were the most democratic, uh, democratically governed countries, the United States and the United Kingdom were one and two in the Global Health Security Index, Canada was number five. These did not necessarily uh, uh, result in the best outcomes in terms of managing the pandemic. And some countries that did not fit with these models of better uh, political structures, as we've heard about earlier, they actually did better and, and did relatively well. So I'm not saying that these other higher level concepts don't don't matter, are not important. They're very much value-based and they're very important, but maybe we need to study actual processes a little more carefully as well, especially in thinking about preparedness uh, or managing existing uh, uh, impending crises. Um, second key observation is we really lack uh, sound frameworks for analyzing organization. Uh, of the systems involved in public health action or even healthcare delivery. I'm struck uh, as a health systems researcher that there's not an internationally uh, applicable definition of what is a hospital. Um, would seem we would assume there would be, but actually when countries report the number of hospitals or hospital beds, they are not reporting the same thing. <laughs> So, um, and you know, we can apply this same question to public health organizations. Right now there's a big interest in national public health institutes. What are they? What do they do? Where are they located? How do they relate to other public health functions? And so on. Um, so this is another area of research that would be useful to expand. Um, and lastly, we learned from the pandemic that uh, health policy and systems, both public health and others more generally, they really need to be better prepared to engage with wider impacts and implications of health crises. Imp uh, issues around schooling, issues around employment and economics, issues around mental health, and so on. And this is not just a matter of the outcomes themselves. This has, this we can learn from the pandemic that this was part of what undermined the trust in the organizations we hope are going to be present to help us respond to these crises. So this is not just a matter of the uh, uh, specific out outcomes that are involved, but even more broadly, the ability of these organizations to work effectively and to engage effectively with political structures to produce better outcomes for all. So thanks very much. Big thanks to all of our of all of our speakers. Now it's your turn to ask all the tough questions to the speakers. So please line up in front of the mics, which are at the middle of the room, and we'll take two questions at a time. Please direct the question to the person that you want, and please take a minute only, so we'll have lots of time to get through all the questions that we have. Um, please go ahead. Oh, if we turn the mics on, please, that would be great. <laughs> good? Can you hear me now? Yeah, okay, we're good. Great. Thank you. Uh, hi, Nick Bass from uh, London. Uh, thank you very much for a uh, really eye-opening session. And uh, I've got a question, I think, mainly for the first two speakers. And it's about um, your, your view that we all need to get more political. Uh, I would respectfully um, point out that certainly in the UK, I don't think any of our politicians have more than a nodding acquaintance with science. And however much, uh, and I think that's probably not far off for, for most of the rest of the world as well. And I wonder, all, for all the information and evidence that we give our politicians to make decisions, they don't really have the same framework of, of looking at the world that we do within the scientific world. And I'm not sure how much, how, how much use that is to them. I wonder if a mechanism for joining, for linking the scientific evidence where we all argue about evidence, but tend to have a rather cautious and risk-averse approach to um, interpreting it, might be to frame things 
uh, in, uh, as a risk assessment and therefore leading to a risk management um, approach rather than just giving them raw data or even summarised scientific data. And also, very, very briefly, for the WHO lady, I was very curious to uh, hear that only 4% of the UN budget is spent on WHO. The average uh, health spend uh, from uh, countries across the world for, um, for health out of their budgets is 9.8% of GDP. Shouldn't the UN, as a representative organisation, reflect that global health spend, perhaps? Thanks, Nick. We'll take uh, then Quinton briefly, and then we'll go to the yeah. questions. It's a quick question, uh, probably a very difficult one, but I want to ask uh, Dr. Vilalba, if I get your name ready, uh, right from your experience in the Ministry of Health. It is a big problem when governments change, sustaining programs, and I've experienced it many times in situations in Africa, even with building of new medical schools when the government's changed, they stop a whole school being built and going on. Are there any models or structures that you know of or can think of whereby sustainability can be maintained across changing of governance? I'm not aware of any, but I was wondering whether you, you might know. Thank you. Maybe, um, Haney, if you go first, and then Khamena, and then I, I might say a word. Please. Sure, just uh, ag agreeing with the comment on the, on the, on the health expend expenditure as a whole. And uh, it's true, you know, actually a point on the health expen ex expenditure in general is that uh, it's been at this level about 10% for the past 25 years or so, but, uh, but I think when we see the military expenditure growing, then also that has a grave implication on the health expenditure. We all know this from, from all the statistics, but I, I do agree. I think the United Nations have more than 40 different agencies, so we are <laughs> fighting for the space, all of us, and this is also the, within the UN family. Actually, all the UN agencies that finish with O, ILO, WHO, FAO, any agency that finishes with O is independent from the UN Secretary General. We are independent agencies who are only reporting to the member states. In our case, we only re report to the ministries of health, not to Antonio Gutierrez. So we, don't, we have a very independent structure and thus we are enabled and our work, is, uh, work agenda is fully driven by the ministries of health or their, uh, the, the, the similar bodies in the country. So thanks for the comment, I fully agree. <laughs> well, thank you very much for, for the question. This is a very good, good question. Well, first of all, <laughs> there's no, uh, as I said before, there's, there's no any um, magic thing or, or anything that will fit all the, the communities are and uh, also countries. But, it, but it's proved and, and it's very important to uh, include civil society uh, in, in not just in the implementation of a program, but also during the design of the intervention. Um, they have to be involved in all the steps in an intervention of public health from the conceptualization of the program to the design in the implementation and also the evaluation of that program. Civil society is, is very important. Let's remember that governments and politics just go and come again. It's, it's a cycle. They, they leave the, the, the government and then they, they are in different roles. But civil society is there. It's stable. So whenever the population feel the ownership of the, of the program because we, we are just there to facilitate them to get the, the results that they need. We are not there to, to impose our cr criteria or, or thoughts. We are there to help them to get what they really need. So when, whenever they feel uh, that they, the, 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 that implementation, that program belongs to the, the community. That's going to help the intervention to be, to be uh, supported for, for the long term. Obviously, sometimes 
uh, or most of the times, we need also the support of stakeholders. So, for example, CUGH is, is a very good supporter. NGOs are supporters. The private sector is also important. I was listening today to one of the, the colleagues that, were, that was giving a, a, a speech about how to engage a private sector to be able to, to have profit, but also to help the communities. That, that's something that we have to put on the table, too. Um, academia is, is very important, because we are not just the people who can produce data, analyze data, interpret data to give them to the, to the uh, decision makers, but also to help them to impl implement and, and, and to evaluate that in those interventions. And uh, also, we, we can have these kind of, of meetings to get support for that, those populations. I think that this is very valuable. International organizations, of course, are vital for those uh, kind of interventions. So, as I said before, we have to, to work together but always the base of the pyramid, which is the population, the civil society, is, is extremely important to maintain those interventions along the time. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Oh yeah, you go ahead, Peter, though. Yeah, I just want to add a brief comment on the, the comment on politicians and scientists. Um, uh, I do think that as scientists, we do need to acknowledge that sometimes we uh, have uh, a kind of narrow tunnel vision on the kinds of questions that we ask, and that politicians sometimes listen to the citizens and raise questions that don't necessarily fit into our scientific, uh, specific scientific paradigm. We saw this in the pandemic when so much of the science was focused on virology, disease transmission, and so on, and public health people were kind of surprised by the challenges that rose from other impacts of pandemic control measures that did not fit into this paradigm of epidemiology and biology. So we, shouldn't, we should listen on both sides. <laughs> and, and if I could say, as I served for 18 years as a member of parliament in Canada, so I know the belly of the beast pretty well. Data is important, but data does not drive politics at all, as Peter and Jimena alluded to. So we need, they're not going to, politicians are not going to come to us, we need to go to them. So the first thing, we have to engage them. Second thing, we have to understand what are their incentives. Big one, get elected. We need to understand that. Two, what are their goals? What are their goals? Not our goals, what are their goals? We have to communicate to them in a language they understand. Data is vitally important, but data doesn't move policies. Stories sell policies, actually. We've got to appeal not only to the coconut, but we also have to appeal to the, to the heart. That doesn't come naturally to us in the world we live in, right? But we have to adapt to their reality, not the other way around. Second, Peter's an economist, so it's really important money matters. So the, the power, and I mean, this, the power at the cabinet table in health is not the health minister. It might be the finance minister, and it's the people in the leader's office and the prime minister or president's office. So you've got to know who you're dealing with. And every country's political power structures are different. So it's really important that you get into the belly and you understand who those people are, what do they do, what are their roles are. Because a lot of them will not be elected and you probably never read about them. But they hold enormous sway. And finally, let's get more scientists elected to our elected bodies, right? We need to take it over. Thanks. <laughs> Please, we'll take the three questions in a row. Thank you. Gotcha. Thank you. Hi. Thank you so much for this um, very important panel uh, in light of so much of what's happening. Um, I am Hiba. I'm a, a recent graduate of Harvard College where I studied history of science and medicine and now uh, first year in the Master of Science program in global health and population. Um, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about and reading up on international human rights and human rights law and reflecting on what they really mean. 
um, in our world today. And so my question probably will be specific, more specific to what Dr. Cohen spoke to. But um, so the, the common story or narrative is that the UN Declaration of Human Rights and all these conventions that were born after, they were born out of the horrors of war and violence and the Holocaust and the deaths of millions of people. Um, and there were so many things that we had to confront as a global community in light of what was happening that forced us to come together and, and come to a consensus on what these values that we want to live by, this, these moral, moral frameworks that we want to operate on. Um, and so thinking about how horrible that time was and the Holocaust has, had to have been for us to come together and do that, how horrible do you think the next big thing has to be in order for us to come together again and reflect on um, and, 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 and discuss what kind of reframing we need to do in order to make these, these values that we've been preaching for many decades true? Because it's, it's, it's very obvious they've been failing. Um, and so what kinds of standards, if maybe that's a rhetorical question, but the more specific question is, what kinds of standards um, do you think will be born out of the current time that we're experiencing this moment with so much happening in Gaza, so much happening in Sudan, the DRC, um, Yemen, Syria for many years? Um, and what does it mean for us to adopt values that we don't practice? Thank you. We'll take all three questions, thank you. Thank you. I bring you greetings from the west coast of Africa, Freetown, Sierra Leone. The name is Sheku Dennis Masakoy, a surgeon, and one of the 18 innovators with Babs in College, Kerry Mofieli Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship, working in the global surgical space. And of course, I want to express my appreciation to the United Nations Institute for Training and Research for the wonderful job they are doing in training LMICs in doing research and education in the global surgery space. So now my question is for all panelists. This is one of my best sessions during the CUGH sessions, okay? Politics and global health. And sometimes I feel emotional because we already know the problems for LMICs to be specific. How do we find a way to infiltrate the political space to ensure we do things in the research space that will impact humanity, that will impact our people that are suffering down there. How do we work some miracle to ensure they see our perspective in terms of you know, education and research? That is one. The second question is, often and again, us as doctors, scientists in the LMICs, in our groups, we discuss politicians like this, politicians like this. At the end of the day, when they take one or two from us to represent us, no changes, the same paradigm. How do we help ourselves to ensure we don't drift in that space, to ensure we work in the interest of science and research? So what suggestion will the panel bring in that domain? Thank you very much. I should take these two and then it'll be a nice compliment the last two questions. No, you stay there and we'll do the last two questions and we'll go to the panel. So please we'll start with Peter and we'll go backwards this way. Thank you. Starting with me. Yeah, we're gonna go start, we're gonna go backwards, reverse. Uh, well, I, I would say that um, the, uh, the, how, how does one uh, try to have an impact on this dichotomy, I think the first and most important thing is to make an effort to understand uh, each other better, okay? Now, there are a few remedies when there are really bad actors, um, but there are many places where there are not absolutely bad actors, but actors who are struggling with problems of scarcity and competing needs and differences in values and so on. So understanding their perspective and trying to, as Keith said earlier, trying to find the space where there is uh, some opportunity to answer the questions they have as well as pose the questions and answers that you have, that might be a useful step forward. Yeah, thanks Many for the, the, the question. I, I think WHO tries to provide this, the evidence, data, science. We have health inequality monitoring tools and others that, that 
all the information is there. I don't think it's about the information, it's about that message. How the health and development progress interlink. And, and I think uh, it's been popular in the past decades to really calculate the return of investment in health, and there are varying calculations like what $1 investment could mean as health outcome and how it could improve the, the, the status of the countries, in particular the lower income and lower middle income country, countries. And, and I think these are the justifications that exist, but it, then it's for the, the people, the constituents of the country, to try and make that case. And I think in many countries, even in, in my own country, I come from Finland that 150 years ago was a very poor country. Still in 1970s, Finland was very poor. But it's only by empowering women, girls, uh, all people, uh, providing education rights and health for all that you can actually bring the whole country to the next level. And I think there are positive stories like this where you can really have a transformative power when you enable empower people, but, but it, it is, I understand and, and, and we see from all uh, data that we look around the world that this is still far from being fulfilled. Uh, but it's, I think it's also your task to, to, to bring this question up in your country, and I, I believe you are doing it, but thanks for bringing it up here. Oh, it'll be on. Is that working? Yeah. Uh, I want to thank Hiba for your question. Um, how horrible does the next thing have to be in order to have another 1947 moment? I, you know, we asked that question during the last crisis in Gaza before 2023, and it obviously wasn't horrible enough then, uh, nor perhaps is it horrible enough now. I, I think we probably have to reframe the question, unfortunately, not to how horrible does the next thing have to be, but <clears throat> who does the perpetrator have to be? Uh, because unfortunately, what the lesson is of the current moment is that the standards exist, but the standards are unevenly applied. Um, the, what, what we're experiencing, in my personal opinion, is we're living out the original contradiction of the international, sorry, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, which was ratified during the Nakba of the Palestinian people. Um, and only now are we seeing the full consequences of the colonial baggage that freights that document. So ultimately, um, in my opinion as a human rights lawyer, this is not a legal problem. Uh, it's a political problem. It's, it's not a problem of lack of standards. There are robust international standards against health facilities as military targets. There are robust laws of war. That it's, a, it's a political problem of uh, the uneven application of those standards to different states' parties. Um, and the, the return of the absolute sovereignty of states, which is what predated the Universal Declaration, being seen to be acceptable by the great powers in some cases and not in others. Um, so I, I think the kinds of things that bring about a change in that political calculus um, is not stronger legal standards, um, but things like the movement for black lives, you know, the, the movement to decolonize global health. That, that's what we'll get at uh, what I fundamentally see as a, as a political problem, not a legal one. Thank you. Maybe if I could, do you want to, should I get the last three questions, Amina, or do you want to see? Uh, yeah, just, okay. just one, one quick comment. Um, I, I really want to say that sometimes I also feel like you a little bit frustrated because um, the policies are there, the laws are there, um, the, frame, the, the, the legal framework is there, 
um, there's a lot of, of things that have been written in, in public health of how the, the, the things should be doing, should have been done, um, but we are not implemented. We are not practicing it, right? How to make it reality, how we put um, all these poem in, in human rights and, and public health and everything in practice. And uh, that, that's something that we have to, to do. I mean, who else? We as public health practitioners must put in practice what has been said, right? Um, and how we can translate all these um, knowledge and, and experience that we have in very simple words to make the politicians perhaps understand that they are not just affecting one population, just one community. They are affecting the, the whole country. They, they are affecting the whole world. Um, and that's why it's important to, to, to perform education. As academics, we have to teach not just our students. We have the, the obligation to teach everybody. I was listening since I don't know how long, perhaps a couple of months, a podcast that, that comes from the WHO, which is very useful. And they were talking about decolonization. Just today I was listening to that podcast. Post podcasts? <laughs> and that was very interesting because this lady who was talking, uh, she said that decolonization is a very strong word and it could be confused confusing because of the, the whole thing that is going on around the world. That's why we don't talk about power balance. So why don't we work to, to improve the power of, of the empowerment of low medium income countries? Um, it's also like they are talking about the south part of the globe. So education. That's, that's something important that we need help. I mean, we can't just do it by, by ourselves because we don't have enough resources. So that's, that's the support that we need from international organizations and high uh, income countries too. Um, yes, sure. Sorry, thank you. I just want to say thank you so much. I just want to get the last, thank you, Dr. Shiko. If I could, this is our lightning round. So we get the last, you've been very patient, everybody there. So we get the last three folks at the mic and we'll do one minute questions, one minute answers. Thank you, please. Okay, so sorry. Can everyone hear me? Hi, my name is Vanessa. I'm a certified global nurse consultant with the International Council of Nurses. I'm also an academic nurse educator. So Dr. Berman, this is for you. I want to highlight something really important about your research and ask for clarification for your end goal. So essentially, um, I spend my time in Nova Scotia and here in California. So I'm dual citizen. I'm very familiar with both health systems, and I understand how the COVID response went with both sides. And I see from your bio you have extensive experience in other countries. So what I want to highlight and ask you for clarification is for myself, I come from nurse and academia background perspective um, with global health um, and nursing education is you know, the information is there. It's about what are we going to do with it, meaning, like, was the response best in Canada and can be used in Haiti, for example? Or I guess, yeah, I just, I really, I think that your work is, is, ex, is exciting because I, I really, I know you said that the comparison analysis is what is lacking, but I, I'm asking, like, if we could get comparison analysis of that type of information, then we could say this is the best response for a pandemic in the future. So thank you Great. for your research. Thank you. We'll go through the questions and then we'll go through the answers. So Dr. Berman will take that view, please. Um, yeah, thank you. Quick question on the topic of corruption and what are your thoughts about addressing corruption that is being promoted by foreign agents within countries, for example, transnational corporations, for example, Canadian mining companies, uh, uh, and also foreign governments in the forms of direct uh, military uh, interventions or the, the promotion of uh, regime change or coups and yeah thank you 
Thank you very much. Simple question. <laughs> Please go ahead. You have the last question. This. Hi, my name is Sanjana. I'm a pediatric um, resident. I'm about to be a pediatric emergency medicine fellow, and I have an interest in DEI and global health. Um, my work is generally around education in DEI and the intersection between that and global health. So in my work, I've come across a couple challenges, um, and I've had two observations. One, for instance, when I do my DEI work meetings, committee meetings, and global health journal clubs, it always seems to be the same people who turn up. And we all know this information, similarly like here. We're all public health practitioners. I have my MPH. This has always been a passion of mine, like many of us in this room. So I don't know if you've come across the same thing where this information that we're sharing is not new to a lot of us. We know this. Where are the lawmakers? Are they invited to these meetings? Where those of us who've been in politics, are we sending out invitations to the people who, like you said, Dr. Martin, money talks. We know that the people with money rule everything in the sovereign nations. If we need their support to help make big changes, then we need to have them looking at the posters that I looked at today um, during our poster session. Um, so I guess my question is, are they invited to these talks? And um, it's sort of different when you're in it versus going to them and talking to their aides and so on. Um, maybe we should reach a handout and invite them here. Great. Thanks, Rich. We'll start at the, Dr. Berman, we'll go back this way. Or actually, yeah. okay, thanks. Good. Great question. Um, uh, really, what does one do with this research and analysis? Um, I think really there's a couple, of, a couple of answers. First of all, we're still trying to figure the, out the, the answer to that question to some degree. I think one thing that one does is one has been, a, we've been able to document that these things do indeed matter and that they vary quite a bit across different settings and contexts. I don't think there's gonna be a one size fits all answer to the solution, but um, uh, one of our objectives is to get these questions about organization and governance introduced as a regular part of the discussion about new investments in public health capacities and preparedness. A lot of the global attention has been on building new laboratories, training more people, buying more PPE, researching new vaccines, but not so much these questions of organization and governance. So how do we do that? And then I think you know, the contexts vary across countries. We're not going to see, the tail doesn't wag the dog. You know, the public health organization is not gonna result in reorganizing the whole government, but perhaps we can find ways that we can improve things at the margin to be better prepared for the next crises or the current crises. Thanks. I just wanna um, <clears throat> quickly address the question about diversity, equity, and inclusion and global health. Um, those are also my two passions. Um, one of the things I'm involved in is something, it's an internal fellowship program at the University of Southern California called Continuous Learning for Anti-Racist Curricular Change. And the, the participants in that program, our fellows are always asking the same question you just did. Why, why is it always the same people doing this? And I don't know, my answer to them is usually that there's actually tremendous value in bringing together the same people <laughs> repeatedly. It, it's an immense professional development opportunity for people. We're, we're actually very fortunate we're able to do it, unlike our counterparts at public universities in Florida where you can't apparently convene to do DEI work. It helps to build prestige around the issues. It creates visibility, curiosity, ultimately does contribute to culture change. So while I don't think it's a substitute for having the political decision makers and the naysayers in the room, I think it's incredibly valuable. Thanks. Um, about the, the, the question, uh, addressing the question about corruption, I, I really don't think that I have the answer. Um, nevertheless, I was thinking this morning when I was um, attending um, the panel about um, guns, gun violence, that we really have to work with civil society. So if we try to, to change the things from the upper part of the pyramid to down, that's not gonna work. 
I uh, think that perhaps we, we, we will try to keep influencing in, in decision makers and uh, politics, but really I think the, the, the change could be done from the base of the pyramid in civil society. So I don't have really the answer, I don't know how to do it, but I, I really going to think how to make an intervention to involve more civil society to change the way we are, we are living right now. Thank you. Thank you. And then finally, just in your questions on the, on the issue of, of corruption, again, you, you've got to have strong systems. You have strong financial systems, oversight mechanisms, strong electoral systems, and strong independent electoral oversight mechanisms. Because unless you have those, then the, no, the country cannot have the ability to deal with and act as a defense against those who would come in and co-opt their own financial systems, co-opt their governments for their own ends or, or, or internally. So unless you have strong public services, public servants, a strong public and independent oversight mechanisms, that can't happen. The second thing is you've got to have a strong media. There's an incredible assault on a freedom of press that's been going on in, for a number of years, and it's getting worse every year. Unless you have a free press, a free press is a pillar of a strong, effective, safe, and secure country that can deliver the public goods they have, where the, pub, where the media is co-opted, where it's affected, where it's taken over. That's when you have serious problems in terms of oversight. And you can see that in any country that has major structural issues right now, corruption and violence, uh, you all of, in almost all of them, the media has been corrupted horribly. And you can look at what's happened in Russia as one example, but there's so many, so many others. Um, and then finally, on the issue of politicians, yes, they're invited, but those are not the people you'd really want. You want to have the senior public servants, but even they're too busy to come here. And even if they saw what was downstairs, that data will not move them. So the key point I'd like to make is we've got to go to their homes. We need to engage them and we need to frame what we're trying to get them to do within the context of the incentives that move them, particularly in terms of getting elected and staying elected. And if we can do that, then that's important, both as a positive but also as a negative. What are the costs of inaction? So there's two things. I need to frame it within that context and we need to engage the public and really make it a, these political, as John said, these are political decisions. Whether you invest in universal health care or not, coverage or not, whether or not you put money to health care or you invest in, in veterinary care services or you have a strong, or you, you co-opt your, um, your, uh, your uh, um, uh, judicial systems or not, uh, whether you attack the media or not, whether you engage in disinformation or not, are political choices. So it's up to us. Anyway, I'd like to have a big thanks to our incredible panel today and to you for coming out. Thanks so much. Thank you.